Hi, and welcome to the RGF 2010 Indoor Air Quality Webinar. I'm Mike Lynch with RGF, and I'll be hosting the training today. A few notes about the training before we get started. Your microphone is muted, but you can ask questions by typing them into the chat box at any time. We'll collect and respond to them after the presentation, which should run just about an hour. Today we're going to cover basic indoor air quality pollutants, what we call our IAQ 101, existing purification technologies to compare and contrast to RGF's PHI and REMI technologies. We'll talk about some products and some testimonials, so without further ado, let's begin. We divide indoor air quality pollutants into three separate categories, particulates, microbes, and gases. Particulates are what most consumers think of when they first think of indoor air quality. Dust is a catch-all term for solid particles in the air less than 500 microns in size. The composition changes by season and geographically. In a desert climate like Arizona, you'll find more ultra-fine sand. In a forested area like Florida, you'll find more plant matter. Pet dander is also classified as a particulate and includes any material shed from the body of an animal, hair cells, skin cells, or anything else. Pet dander can be a very, very aggressive allergen. When someone says the traditional I'm allergic to cats or dogs, they're referring to an allergy to the dander the animals give off. Pollen is another aggressive allergen classified as a particulate. Released by certain plant species, pollen is very small and lightweight. It stays airborne for extended periods of time and are what you traditionally think of when you have hay fever or ragweed type of allergies. All of the particulates here have a few things in common. They must be physically removed from the space in order to alleviate the symptoms, the general allergic reactions that they'll cause. You can't kill a piece of dust or dander, it's not alive. You need to find some way, when we're talking about purification, to physically pull these particulates out of the air. Bacteria are single-celled organisms that can reproduce without a host. Some common examples of bacteria are MRSA, an antibiotic-resistant staph infection, E. coli, usually the culprit of the tainted food outbreaks you'll see, staph infections, and strep throat, which again is something common that many children will pick up at school. Compared to bacteria, viruses are a minimal structure of genetic material and protein, and are so small they can only be seen with an electron microscope. If you were to suspend a virus in the middle of a room, it would take 10 days for that virus to settle down to the ground with no other air movement. So every time your air conditioner turns on, you walk through a room, or open a door, that air movement is going to keep viruses suspended in the air for extended periods of time. Some examples of viruses include Norwalk virus, the cruise ship virus and accounting for over half of the stomach flus in America, the SARS virus, of which there was an outbreak in 2003 in China and Toronto, avian flu, which was in Southeast Asia, and the H1N1 virus, which is currently sweeping the world. Mold spores are also classified in the microbial category. And to better understand mold spores, we need to be sure that we understand the life cycle of mold. Mold that you see growing on a wall is called a mold colony. As the mold colony grows, it releases single-celled organisms called mold spores into the air. Uh, as soon as conditions permit, these mold spores will grow into new mold colonies, whether looking for something damp or a place where the temperature is high or there's no light. When they find the conditions they're looking for, a mold spore will then grow into a new mold colony, which will release more spores into the air. Mold spores on their own are a very aggressive allergen and can cause allergic reactions, asthma episodes, irritations, infections, and sinus congestion problem. From an indoor air quality perspective, our goal is to eliminate airborne mold spores. If you start with a clean space and can eliminate the airborne mold spores, you have the best chance of minimizing mold colony growth within the building in question. Our last category of indoor air quality pollutants includes gases like VOCs and odors. VOCs, or volatile organic compounds, are created by the evaporation of additives in products that we use every day. This evaporation is referred to as off-gassing. These additives are put in products to give them certain properties. It will make paints and carpets last longer and be more fade resistant. It will give pressed wood products a nice bright shine. It will make adhesives more powerful. VOCs haven't always been a problem, even though we've been using these chemicals for a long time. 
older construction used to be built much looser, and more fresh air would be able to get into the space, diluting the levels of VOCs down to within the safety range. However, as we've built buildings tighter, limiting the amount of airflow from the outside to increase energy efficiency, we've begun to lock pollutants in to our buildings. A piece of new construction with all of its painting, carpeting, cleaning products, pressed wood, cabinetry, is going to have a three-year supply of VOCs built right into it. A recent example of a high VOC buildup happened after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. FEMA built a large number of trailers very quickly to bring them down to house victims who had lost their house in the hurricane. They were made with a number of cheap materials, and those materials had a high amount of formaldehydes and other VOCs off-gassing from them. Because the trailers were made with inadequate ventilation, these very quickly built up to levels that made them unlivable. Currently today, some contractors use RGF equipment to restore these trailers back to usable form. Odors are also classified as a gaseous indoor air quality pollutant. And when we're talking about odors, the important point to get across is that all odors are classified together whether we like them or not. It doesn't matter if it's perfumes, scented candles, and incense, or wet dog, old fish, and what you cooked for dinner last night. Our goal is to eliminate all of the odors in the air, leaving just the clean air behind, not to make a room smell like strawberries. Many problems in the gaseous category are easy to identify. If you have odors, we're all equipped with a pretty sensitive odor meter to detect them. However, something like VOCs may not necessarily be noticeable by smell alone. You'll want to look for the telltale signs, a large renovation project, new cabinets, carpets, paints, or any kind of new construction are prime targets for a VOC problem waiting to happen. Identifying your pollutant is the first step towards finding the right kind of purification equipment. Are you dealing with allergy issues, someone who maybe has an allergy to dust, dander, or pollen? Is someone concerned about potential illness or the spread of mold in their home? Or is there a potential VOC or odor source already in the building? By identifying and focusing on a couple of different categories of air quality pollutants, you're better able to select purification equipment that will get the job done the first time around. Now, let's look at some of the different kinds of technologies and where they may be effective in purifying the different categories of air quality pollutants.